वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम प्रोफेसर शारदा श्रीनिवासन फ्रॉम द नेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ एडवांस स्टडीज वेर आई एम द डीन ऑफ द स्कूल ऑफ ह्यूमैनिटीज एंड वी आर पार्ट ऑफ द इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ साइंस कैंपस इन बेंगलोर एंड एज पार्ट ऑफ दिस ई पी जी पाठशाला मॉड्यूल आई बी टॉकिंग ऑन हिस्ट्री ऑफ मेटल आइकॉन्स एज पार्ट ऑफ द सब्जेक्ट ऑफ इंडियन कल्चर and art and architecture of india so the objectives of this module is to know about the history of metal icons in the indian subcontinent and with specific reference perhaps to south india and to also understand a bit more about the stylistic evolution of images of different affiliations of hindu buddhist and jain iconography and to give a few insights into the technological trajectory we have looked at more detail at chola bronzes in another module and this would aim to explore the other bronze casting techniques in various other regions to get a totality of the understanding of technology and stylistic aspects of metal icons in the subcontinent so to delve into the historical background the term icon is derived from the greek word for an image and it refers to a work of art which has a specific religious connotation or purpose we find that going back to the harappan sites of 2500 bc there are numerous terracotta figurines which have broadly been labeled as mother goddess images although we can't be sure what they actually were such as from mohind the jadaro which suggest a widespread cult of perhaps a female divinity with some votive or ritual connotations a celebrated metal figurine is the petite mohenjodaro dancing girl of circa 2500 bce of barely 10 cm which is likely to have been made of the lost wax or lost resin process from its fluid lines and you're looking here at some images of the mother goddess figurines and the metal figurine of the dancing girl when we look at the emergence of statuary bronzes there is a bit of a hiatus in the post harappan scenario but there is a small and remarkable mother goddess figurine again from adichennur in tamil nadu dated to about 1000 bce apart from other finds such as a remarkable tiger figurine from kodumanal also of the megalithic period 3rd century bce inlaid with lapis lazuli and carnelian we also have the remarkable daimabad hoard from maharashtra such as this elephant standing on top of a pedestal with processional holes which vaguely brings to mind the processional icons of the south indian bronzes which is attributed to the late harappan period of about 1500 bce However it is really from the early historic period in the Indian subcontinent that tangible evidence for icons is found in a way that can be linked more directly to the major present day Indian religious traditions metal figurines seem to have come into vogue in the Indian subcontinent in the aftermath of Alexander's incursions in 326 BCE and there is a marked greco-bactrian influence in early iconography metal images were cast under the various dynasties of the kushans sungas and shatavahanas which were mainly of buddhist and jain faiths some key find spots include the gandharan region of takshashila or takshila in northwest india mathura in central india and amravati in andhra pradesh and nagarjun konda and kaveri patanam in tamil nadu coming to the medieval metal icons they were widely cast under the hindu buddhist and jain pantheons beginning from the early historic period and continuing up to the late medieval period we may note that the votive images of buddhist and jain faiths often had donor inscriptions and they were probably carried around as votive images On the other hand few Hindu images were inscribed since they were intended mainly as representations of divinities 
The makings of murtis or religious icons became codified in artistic treatises such as the Shilpa Shastras. Devotional statuary metal icons were made across the Indian subcontinent and were associated with the spread of Buddhism and Hinduism into Southeast Asia and East Asia and also encompassing the Indo-Tibetan regions, Thailand, Indonesia, China, Japan, Korea and Sri Lanka. There are about five major schools of bronze casting which then emerge across the different regions in the Indian subcontinent. We have the Western Indian bronzes which are often Jain. Then we have the late Gupta and post Gupta bronzes of Central India. The Pala bronzes of Eastern India which are uh, mainly Buddhist. Kashmir and Himalayan bronzes. Kashmir bronzes include some important Brahminical ones and the Himalayan bronzes are often Buddhist and we also have the South Indian styles which also encompass mainly Hindu but also Buddhist and Jain bronzes and metal icons. We now look at some interesting aspects of technology as far as metal icons are concerned. It's interesting that during the Gupta period the large Buddha images were made by what is called the hollow lust wax process which typically follows the Hellenistic practices whereby a wax model was built up on a clay core which was also held up with iron armatures and the, the iron armatures followed the progression of the limbs and such like and the clay core was built on it and then a thin layer, was ax, a thin layer of wax was added onto the clay core so that when the mold was then formed by investing it with numerous layers of clay and when the wax was melted out it is a thin layer of metal which forms on top of the clay core and often the clay core is actually left intact inside the sculpture. Of course the image casting process itself is described in various Shilpa Shastras as Madhu Chahista Vidhana or the lost wax process in the Manasara and Manasol Lhasa. If you look at some of the technical aspects, when we examine a South Indian cast image using the technology of X-ray radiography, you can make out that it is a solid cast because the X-rays don't pass through the image and the density. So we know that it's a solid casting. However, if you look at some of the North Indian images such as from Akota, this Buddha image, you can clearly see the damaged clay core which is retained inside the casting on top of which the wax model was added to give a thin metal layer. So the hollow casting method does economize on the metal to be used but as you can see here it also results in very fragile castings which can be damaged more easily. A spectacular example of a Gupta era image is the lifelike Sultan Ganj Buddha in the Birmingham Museum which is about almost entirely of cast copper which is again made of the hollow casting process with the iron armature retained inside the casting. Another process which came popularly into vogue with the use of Buddhist images such as in Eastern India was of gilding by which copper alloy metal icons were given a coating of gold which added to their aura and aesthetic appeal and which was undertaken either by mechanical means or by chemical means of mercury amalgam application followed by burnishing resulting in a layer of gold on the image which was used quite widely in various parts of India including northern and southern India but especially the Buddhist images and in the Indo-Tibetan and Nepalese region. How did these alloys come to be extracted? Another dimension to the study of metal icons is the exploration of old workings and old mining areas. We don't have too much time to go into it but I would like to point to an important copper mining area of Karnataka which is Ingaldhal and you can still see the mining galleries there, the streaks of malachite on the ore bodies where the primary and secondary ore were mined out to extract copper. And the old workings there also have slag heaps, some of which have 
russet coated ware from the Shatavahana era and there are also carbon dates which tie the workings to the Shatavahana period. So it's likely that by this period, the early historic period under the Shatavahanas, the copper mines of Ingaldal were being in use. And I also show this slide to show what the actual metallic structure or metallurgical structure of the slag looks like. The slag is the waste product from smelting. It is a byproduct of the smelting process whereby the metal, once it has been smelted as a liquid, it settles to the base of the furnace and the slag which contains all the impurities such as the lighter, silica and siliceous material from the ore bodies, that tends to float on top of the metal and that also contains certain solidified remnants of the metal which we describe as metallic prills here and here you can see the copper metal trapped in that which also confirms that the metallurgical process of extraction of copper was being undertaken at this mining site. Looking at another aspect of technology, it's interesting that in the South Indian bronzes, the tin content never exceeded about 15%, which is very sensible because bronze becomes very brittle as you add more tin. On the other hand, you can see an image here of a Thai bronze, which has 22% tin as cast, where the fingers look bro broken and damaged due to the brittleness caused by heightened bronze. However, as I've mentioned in another module, one must also note that there is already a very long-standing and skilled tradition in southern India, going back to megalithic times, of using bronze of a high tin content with 23% tin, whereby the brittleness of bronze was overcome by quenching it to get the beta phase of bronze, which had musical properties and it improved the tensile strength of the bronze. So this extraordinary alloy was being used in parallel, whereas for the cast image, they were very sensibly using mainly leaded bronzes. And coming to technology and art, another interesting dimension is that the celebrated Nataraja bronze, which is usually attributed to the Chola period, was attributed to the Pallava period by the lead isotope analysis that I had undertaken to differentiate different groups of bronzes. And it's also interesting that if we look at the sculptural traditions, at Badami you have the dynamic depiction of Natasha in sandstone, where here Natasha is dancing in the Chatura Tandava pose. And from the Pallava period, you have a very small frieze at Siamangalam, which shows Shiva dancing with the leg extended in the Bhujangatrasta Karna. And as I mentioned, I identified a particular Pallava piece of Nataraja with the leg extended also in the Bhujangatrasta Karna. And around this time, you also have the evocative verses of Manika Vachikar, which says, let us praise the Kutan who dances creating, destroying this heaven, earth and all else. We now come to the giant bronzes, which were a very important aspect of the Indian artistic output. In Jainism, the practice of darshana or being visually inspired by the act of seeing the divinity or the deva was also important. And so we have numerous icons of jinas and yakshis and goddesses such as Ambika and Indra and Saraswati and Lakshmi from the Brahminical pantheon who also came to be depicted in Jain ritual worship. Karnataka was one of the famous centers of early Jainism as seen by the uh, remarkable colossal freestanding monolith of Shravana Belagola of Bahubali belonging to the Ganga period which is the most remarkable Jain monument anywhere. And several bronze images have also been found at Shavara Beragola. Several bronzes have also been attributed to the Chalukyas of Karnataka from about the 7th century. The Jain Yakshi Ambika also seems to have been quite popular in the Jain centers in Karnataka. And we are looking at a Chauri bearer which is attributed to Karnataka with a fly whisk. And there is also a very well-known bronze of Bahubali, which is in the CSVMS Museum in Mumbai. And 
this depicts bahubali standing very erect rather similar to the shravana belagola depiction and with creepers entwined all around and it does evoke the depiction that you see at shravana belagola of the ganga period the gambara sect of jainism was more popular in karnataka and tamil nadu which depicts the tithankara as sky clad or without any clothes but the bronzes of the swetambara or white clad sect have also come to light in gujarat such as of shantinatha another important center of jainism was in south arcot district in tamil nadu of the late chola period where there are fine depictions of the goddess ambika from singani kuppam indeed the chola prince kundavai was a well known patroness of jainism we also look at the rich bronze tradition of kashmir of metal icons which was a famous center in north india both for buddhist and brahmanical bronzes and the art of kashmir was also influenced heavily by gandharan art and there are a number of bronzes of kashmir which are attributed to the period of the utpala kings of 855 to 936 ce one famous example is of the vaikuntha chaturmurti vishnu of 9th century where vishnu is depicted in his benign form but as a composite along with the avatars such as the lion head associated with the man lion form of narasimha and there is also the boar head associated with varaha or the boar incarnation and a fourth ferocious head each of which faces a different cardinal direction one interesting difference between the north indian and south indian bronzes is that you don't find the lugs or the holes which you find in the south indian bronzes which indicated they were taken out in procession and at the base of this image you also see a channel for libation many of the votive images from kashmir also influenced the styles of tibetan and chinese bronzes the raj tarangini which was written by kalhana in the 12th century and also contains various historical accounts also mentions the metal icons made in kashmir and mentions that the queen dida was a major patroness of bronzes though she was considered to be a fairly ruthless queen a remarkable example of another bronze from the region is the bodhisattva manjushri which is one of the oldest bodhisattvas in the mahayana buddhist pantheon we now come to the buddhist bronzes of eastern india and southern india nalanda which is a celebrated site of a major buddhist monastic establishment or mahavira and which was one of the oldest universities is also an important fine spot of bronzes buddhism flourished at nalanda from the gupta period of the 5th to 6th centuries onwards where both mahayana and hinayana buddhism were being taught here you see the use of mercury gilding on the images quite often northern indian images are also made of brass an alloy of copper and zinc in the eastern indian buddhist bronzes the buddha stands on a lotus pedestal with his right hand in abhaya mudra and the left hand is in varada mudra and often he also holds the garment the sites in eastern india which have yielded bronzes include sultan ganj nalanda and kurkihar from about the 10th century pala period a more prominent tantric or mahayana phase also came into vogue with depictions of numerous bodhisattvas such as avalokiteshvara and maitreya and manjushri and so on tamil nadu also had a very rich tradition of buddhist bronzes and the inscriptions of various chola rulers also mention the endowments to the vihara at nagapatnam which is said to have been patronized by the shri vijayan king of southeast asia in fact nagapatnam is the single largest fine spot of bronzes in india and as many of 350 bronzes have been uncovered in hoards from nagapatnam nagapatnam also had a brick pagoda which was pulled down by the jesuits and many of the images there were buried recovered as buried hoards many of these nagapatnam bronzes are inscribed and they are dated to the period of rajaraja to kulotunga 1 and also a century later 
One of the typical features of the Nagapatnam Buddhas is the flame type Ushnisha on the head of the Buddha, which then becomes a distinctive feature of Chola and South Indian Buddhas. And the Ushnisha also influences the depictions in Sri Lankan art. We also see here in this Nagapatnam Buddha that the robe is worn on one shoulder in a very distinctive style. Some of the Buddha images from Nagapatnam also have processional holes, which suggest that there were some syncretic traditions cutting across Buddhism and Hinduism. And of course, the Buddha also finds representation in the Hindu pantheon as one of the avatars of Vishnu. And we also see a small sculpture of the Buddha at the Brihadishwara temple of Rajaraja. In the post-Chola period, there was a slump of images. However, under the Vijayanagara and Nayaka rulers, the making of South Indian bronzes again flourished and Vaishnava images in particular came prominently into vogue in southern India with Krishnadevaraya appointing governors, the Nayakas, from about 1512 AD at Jinji, Tanjavur and Madurai in Tamil Nadu. In many ways, the Vijayanagara and Nayaka rulers refashioned and carried on the earlier Chola artistic idiom in bronzes as well. Of course, many of the Vijayanagara and Nayaka bronzes are also found in the region of Tanjavur. And although they carry on the Chola tradition, there are differences in terms of the iconography. We find far fewer Nataraja images from the Vijayanagara and Nayaka repertoire, which makes sense when you realize that they were predominantly Vaishnava in terms of their religious affiliations. Another interesting aspect is that you see the use of brass more in the Vijayanagara period. And there is one image which I've analyzed which had 21% of zinc in it. As seen in the earlier slide, there was also an image of Kaliya Krishna, which starts becoming rather popular in the Vijayanagara period, a depiction of Krishna dancing upon the serpent Kali, depicted with the five heads and with the tail of the serpent waving upwards. And it's a very lively and popular depiction of the Vijayanagara period. Another remarkable aspect is that of the royal metal portraits. At the temple at Tirupati dedicated to Balaji, a form of Vishnu, there is a remarkable set of inscribed life-size copper alloy icons of Krishnadevaraya, the great king, and his two queens, all of whom are depicted with their palms folded in the devotional gesture of Anjali Mudra as devotees of Tirupati Balaji. And this is said to have been presented to the Tirumala temple in 1518. Krishnadevaraya, of course, ruled from his capital in Vijayanagara in Hampi, and it is a mark of his great dedication to Balaji that the set of icons was dedicated to that temple. As another interesting example of a royal portrait, there is a small portrait of Sarfoji, the 18th century Maratha ruler of Tanjavur. In this small gilded image, the Maharaja is depicted with his hands joined in the devotional Anjali Mudra. And he is attired in a choga garment with a sash over his shoulders reaching his knees and a Maratha style turban on his head. This is quite interesting because although we do have bronzes in the later Nayaka and Maratha period of the 18th century, many of them of course follow the broader conventions of South Indian bronze casting and iconography and the Talamana proportions therein. However, this one is more naturalistic and is quite different in that it actually tries to depict the Maratha king as he would have been with his particular attire and turban examples of which one would find perhaps more in miniature paintings. And it's also interesting that the base has holes which are similar to those for taking South Indian religion's icons out in procession, suggesting a deified role for the ruler, which was something we also saw in the case of processional icons being made, which were said to have been representations of the Chola queen Sembian Mahadevi. 
So there is a link here between royalty and divinity which endures over the ages. In summary, we have seen that there is a diverse and lively metal icon making tradition and metal figurine making tradition in the Indian subcontinent. And apart from the classical tradition, there are also several folk bronzes and lively folk and tribal bronzes made in different parts of India, which fell out of the normal Agamic traditions, but have also formed a very important part of Indian metallurgical heritage. And these traditions and conventions have carried on over several centuries into the present day, though unfortunately, as with other metalworking practices, several of these artisanal traditions are on the decline and need to be supported so that they can continue into future generations. You can read more in the e-text and the list of references given with the accompanying text. Thank you.